Good evening, everyone. This is Ritika Gupta, Assistant Director at Impact and Policy Research Institute, IMPRI, New Delhi. On behalf of Team IMPRI, I welcome you to IMPRI Hashtag Web Policy Talk and special lecture by Professor Santosh Mehrotra on labor, employment, and the pandemic, policy suggestions, and the way forward for budget 2021. I would now like to invite our moderator for today, Professor Utpal Kumar Day, who is Professor of Economics at Northeastern Hill University, Shillong, and Visiting Professor at Impact and Policy Research Institute. Professor Day, floor is yours now. Thank you. So, thanks a lot, uh, Aditika. So, good evening, friends. Uh, as all of you know, that under eco-development discussion series of the Impact Policy Research uh, Institute of New Delhi, we have started a series of discussions on the policy involvement of the, on the part of the government on various aspects of the develop, economic development in South Asia a few months back. We have already addressed uh, from Bangladesh, from Sri Lanka, from India, from Nepal, as well as from Bhutan, on various aspects of the development issues, that is policy related to the rural development, agriculture, uh, policy responses to the natural disaster or climate change events, on the foreign trade issues under this pandemic situations, and how government policies are tackling to uh, moderate the adverse impact of this pandemic and several other issues, financial generation, and so on. So under this uh, scheme, we have today a special lecture on the topic labor, employment, and pandemic policy suggestions and way forward for the budget 2021. As all of you know that this uh, budget of government of India is just uh, near the corner. So uh, some series of discussions on this, what to be done uh, in the next visit in regard to the um, in, in regard to the development of the country uh, under this uh, situations where the economy of India has sinked significantly in the first and second quarter, and there is an apprehension you have seen in all the newspaper daily today and yesterday. Uh, that uh, there is a chance of annual shrinkage of the India GDP by more than 7% and that may be extended to the 10% even. So we have with us today uh, 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 Professor Santos Mehrotra, so who does not need any introduction. Uh, he is a prolific writer and he was a professor of Jawaharlal Nehru University under that Center for Informal Sector and Labor Studies. He was the head of that institute, former director of Institute of Applied Manpower Research. He was involved in Niti Aayog, that was formerly Planning Commission of India. Also, Professor Mehrutra was human development economist, and he does a lot of work on human development related to that, labor, unemployment issues, informal sector. He was the first head of the rural development division and then development policy divisions of government of india he is one of the author of the 11 five year plan and he led the team uh, for the indian human development report 2011. so this is just a brief about professor mehratra so there is no end if i go on uh, speaking about professor mehratra he was visiting a professor at the University of Bath during 2010 and 13. Also, he worked in various capacities and United Nations Development Program, also UNICEF. Also, he worked in the fields of industry, trade, macroeconomic policies, and so on. So numerous articles he has written in various national and international journals, and also a number of books from various international uh, publications of repute like Cambridge, Sage, uh, Springer, Oxford. So there is no end to it. So I don't want to prolong uh, to say about even on the policy research. Every now and day, uh, now and then, I see that uh, Professor, uh, Professor Mehrotra's writing comes in daily newspapers and various blogs also. So he he 
captures uh, his uh, uh, expertise. He has that expertise in various fields from the labor, employment, and unemployment issues, uh, uh, as well as well as the um, uh, educational issues of the country on the various aspects of the human development. So I don't want to prolong that. So today's lecture series will be chaired by Professor Dev Nathan, who is in the Institute of Human Development, New Delhi. And he was also at the, uh, he, he normally writes at EPW regularly and was at the Global Value Change Center of the Duke. Professor uh, Dev Nathan was affiliated to the Institute of Human Development and Gender Center and Society for Labor and Development. He is also the co-editor of Cambridge University series of Global Value Chains, also the co-author of We Chance and for forthcoming reverse sites in global production. So we have another um, prolific uh, professor and uh, author of various uh, articles in different uh, fields. Professor Dev Nathan, who will be uh, chairing this refitting session that will be developed, uh, uh, delivered by Professor Santos Mehrathra, sir. I know him uh, uh, for a long period of time uh, in different capacities. He was associated with us. He delivered several lectures also, including one uh, conference that I had on, organized in 2015. Mm -hmm. He delivered the keynote address to take the chair and invite Professor Mehratra to deliver his lecture today. So we welcome both of you. Also, just to mention in connection with that, today we will have with us as a discussion Professor Sarchi Acharya, uh, who is a, uh, another honorary professor of Institute of Development Studies, Joypur, formerly and also the chief no, in Cambodia, Laubidia, etc. And also we have with us Professor Amrita Pillai, uh, who is a lawyer by profession and policy analyst researcher at the NIPFP New Delhi. So I don't want to take much long time. Everybody is looking forward to hear Professor Santos Mehratra. Now I request Professor Dev Nathan to chair the session and again request Professor Mehratra to deliver his lecture. Sir Dev Nathan. Okay. Thank, thank you, Professor Dev, for all this introduction. I will just go on and request Santosh to go ahead and please deliver his lecture. Thank you, Santosh. Go ahead. We can't hear you. No, no, I know, I know. Um, well, thank you very much, Arjun. Thank you, uh, Utpal. Thank you, Devnathan, for uh, your kind introductions. Let me sort of go launch straight away. I understand that I have about 20 or 22 minutes, so I'll, I'll uh, try and keep within that time. So the structure of what I plan to say today is fourfold. I'll begin uh, by, you know, putting the context to my lecture by speaking about when our demographic dividend is about to end. Second, I'll speak about uh, the challenge of employment by briefly speaking about the stock of employables who will be looking for, our, for work or are looking for work um, um, in our economy. Uh, thirdly, these are, uh, these are my estimates. Fourth, I'll speak a little bit about how the economy has performed from 2014 onwards and what has landed us in this current crisis uh, in 2020. And uh, then finally close by speaking about the budget. And uh, uh, so that's, that's the structure of my presentation. Um, the demographic dividend is defined as uh, that period in the life of a nation, which comes but once in the life of a nation, uh, where the share of the working age population is rising and the share of the dependent population is falling. The dependent population obviously defined as those who are below the age of 15 and those who are above the age of 64. Now, we India entered this period um, in the early 1980s 
And this period, which comes but once in the life of a nation, it came in the life of every nation, it comes but once in the life of any nation, ours will end by 2040, latest. That means we are already two-thirds of the way into our dividend. We have not a single year to lose. Because a dividend will be a dividend only if we have managed to employ all the young people who are entering the joining and entering the uh, working age. And hopefully they will join the labor force. China per capita income was the same as ours in 1979. It has completely transformed itself, reduced poverty by growing at 9 to 10 percent per annum because it rode the wave of the demographic dividend. We have almost never achieved uh, 10, 9 to 10 percent growth, but for three years. So the challenge you can imagine is very, very significant. So much by, for, for, for setting the context. Let me turn to the uh, laying out the, the actual nature of the, the employment challenge. What is the stock of employables who will be or looking for work, are look, currently looking for work, that's, I want to give you a feel for that. This is all available in my published work, but therefore I will be extremely brief. Um, the first consists, of course, of those who are currently unemployed. I, I'm sure all of you are familiar with, uh, the, with the fact that in 2018, our open unemployment rate had reached a level uh, never seen before in 45 years, ever since we started, the NSS started doing the labor force survey. Youth unemployment had tripled between 2012 and 2018 uh, from 6% to 18%. If you were a graduate, it had gone from 18% to 36% and so on. All this is in, in it's, you know, published in my, in my papers, and I'm not going to go any further in, into this. The result of this was that already in early 2020, we had about 30 million unemployed people. The pandemic has only added to that. So that's one element that we have to keep in mind. Uh, the second element is of course those who are in education. The stock of those who are in education has risen very sharply from about 2000, 2004, 5 onwards, which is not surprising because uh, we entered, we, we, uh, our population growth rate had peaked by the early 1980s. These, these young people were, all, were entering the labor force by about the year 2000. So since then, they started going, getting into education and the stock of those who are between 15 and 29 um, who are in education is 127 million in, in 2019. This will create a flow. Every year, millions will join the labor force. And I estimate that this, these millions will be joining at an accelerating pace. They are probably currently joining at around 5 million per annum. And they will join at an accelerating pace between now and the next 10 years until 2030. They will be joining at a decelerating pace from 2030 to 2040. After 2040, their numbers will begin to, uh, to decline. So that's the second group that has to be taken care of. There's a third group, which consists of what in our estimates, we call the not in labor employment, not in the labor force employment or training. This is a stock of about 125 million people. A significant proportion of this is, consists of girls. In other words, these are people who are not in education, not in training, and they are not looking for work, although they should be looking for work because they have acquired a certain amount of education. And this is particularly true for girls. 
So you can imagine the second between the the third group, the, the sorry, the first group, the second group, and the third group. I've already listed for you a, a, a stock of about 250 to 280 million people. In addition, there are those in agriculture, 205 million in the last count, and they need to be pulled out of agriculture. Otherwise, rural distress is never going to begin to fall. They, because non-farm jobs were being created at a phenomenal pace between 2004, five and 2012, because we had averaged a growth rate of 8% per annum over that period, that seven year period, and we were generating seven and a half million new non-farm jobs every year. For the first time in India's history, agriculture shed workers in absolute terms. Agriculture was always shedding workers, but the to absolute number of workers in agriculture since independence has been rising all the way till 2004-5. It began to fall only post 2004-5. And it has been fall, it, was, it began by fall, falling 5 million per annum. Those have to be absorbed every year. In that period, when we were growing at 8% per annum, they were getting absorbed significantly in construction jobs because infrastructure investment had risen, private investment in real estate had risen. So construction became a very, a booming sector and construction accounted for in the year 2000, about 17 mil, uh, for 17 million jobs. That had risen by 2004 5 to about 26 million. But between 2004 5 and 11 12, the construction sector employment rose from about 26 million to 51 million. It nearly doubled. And it has continued to grow since then, but at a much slower pace. So clearly, we need to continue to pull workers out of agriculture. But what did the pandemic do? It actually sent workers back home. Now, let me turn very quickly to what was to, to the third part of, of what I wanted to say, which is what was happening to growth post 2014. It had already begun to slow somewhat compared to the period all the way until 2014. And it is remarkable that we managed an 8% per annum growth rate over the period 2004 to 14, despite a global economic crisis. We put in place a fiscal stimulus and the monetary policy stimulus after 2008, which turned the economy around very quickly. And that's why we sustained the growth in jobs and we sustained the growth in, in, in GDP. So it had begun to slow already post 2014. I won't, to go, I won't go into the reasons why, because I think that will take me over my 20 minutes. I'm leaving the space open for my, for my discussion. But the fact remains that a series of policy mistakes from late 2016 by this government resulted in in slowing quarter by quarter growth for nine quarters prior to 20, the beginning of 2020. Every quarter, the growth rate fell, every quarter. So that in 1920, your GDP growth rate was down to 4.1% and your unemployment had continued to climb. In this crisis came the pandemic. And unfortunately, the pandemic has been handled or mishandled so, so badly that India's economy has contracted to a greater extent in 2020 or FY21 than any other G20 country. And we need to have find some explanation as to why our GDP contraction is among the worst in the G20. And I would like to offer you 
four reasons in the way the pandemic was handled that we became the second biggest contributor to COVID-19 cases across the globe. We may keep, continue to pat ourselves on the back that we have a very high recovery rate, that we have a very low death rate, but that is never not surprising. It has not been surprising to any epidemiologist because, as, <laughs> because precisely because we are a very young nation. We are a very youthful nation and our capacity to withstand disease has actually, uh, the, of the young has stood, has, has been, has, has stood us well. But that's merely fortuitous. What was the nature of, what was the nature of our lockdown? First, it came at four hours notice. South Africa, which is one twentieth the population of India, one tenth in terms of sheer physical size, gave four days notice. We have a much more diverse country, a much more complex country, a federal country, and a four hour notice meant that states were hardly consulted at all. The suddenness shook the economy very badly. As a result, it was a very poorly planned lockdown. And in fact, the first serious notification of regulations and rules about how, how the administration is going to behave, the police is going to behave, came on the 15th of April, good three weeks after the lockdown had been imposed. This is what happens when you get a notification at four hour to lock down the whole economy and the whole country. Secondly, it was too early, the lockdown. We had under 600 cases. Unfortunately, since then, we began to unlock at precisely the time when we hadn't even reached the peak. Europe was unlocking when they had reached a peak and they had seen a decline in the addition of new cases. We were unlocking at precisely the time when the number of cases was actually rising every day. I'll come back to that in a minute as to why that was happening. The third reason, the third problem with the lockdown was that it was national in scope. Did China carry out a national lockdown? No. They locked down Wuhan city first, which is where the where COVID outbreak took place. And then they locked down Hubei province of which Wuhan is the capital. And they locked down other major cities and they prevented all travel between Wuhan and Hubei to all other parts of the country. They didn't lock down the whole country, nor did they prevent travel between one part of the country to other parts of the country. We locked down every part of the country for which there was no particular reason for doing, given that all the way till June, July, 80% of the cases were confined to nine cities. We could have locked down just those nine cities because that's where the international travelers were coming in. What we did was to lock our slum dwellers and our hovel dwellers in our cities, in their one room tenements, four to a room, the family or, you know, with, with their other worker brethren, where they contracted the disease. And when the shramic trains began to spread out across the country, the disease spread with them across the whole country. Community transmission had already begun in the, by the middle of June. And the result was by about August, we had a situation where 50% of the cases were confined to the nine cities and remaining 50% with the rest of the country and growing every day. And the final problem was that it was one of the most stringent lockdowns in the, in the world by the Oxford School of Government uh, metric. It was one of the most stringent. And the IMF has done an analysis of lockdowns across the world and has come to a conclusion I've just you know, I'm in the verge of finishing a paper examining what the nature of the lockdowns and the nature of the stimuli were that were put in place across the G20 and across other countries. 
and you, you, you discover to your horror that ours was among the most stringent. And there is a real strong relationship between the stringency of the lockdown and the, and the severity of the GDP contraction. These are the reasons why our contraction is among the worst in the world. In this context, you would have expected a fiscal stimulus of nothing less than 3 to 4% of GDP. What have we got? We've got 2% of GDP being provided by way of fiscal stimulus after three stimuli, uh, three Atman Nirbhar Bharat schemes being put in place, which is about half of the, of the size of the fiscal stimulus we put in place post-2008 global economic crisis in India at a time when, the, global econ when the, the impact on our economy was much weaker. What is the implication of all this for our budget? I'll just say three or four things. First, we need to put aside our FRBM requirements. We have to borrow more. It's already coming too late. And what we borrow needs to go into infrastructure investment so that jobs can be created in construction and in the infrastructure. Because this will crowd in private investment. Private investment has been dropping. Today's numbers in respect of consumption and private investment are utterly shocking. I mean, it, it would interest you to know that per capita income in 20 in FY21 is likely to be back to 2016-17 levels, as is private investment in absolute real terms. Uh, consumption has dropped to 56% of, of GDP, and you can't expect exports to be growing. So clearly investment is not rising. Consumption is not rising, two of the, of the engines of growth. You don't, ex you don't expect exports to rise. And in any case, government's sort of poor policies had led to a decline in, in merchandise exports every year from the base of 2013. You won't believe this. Our exports were $315 billion in 2013-14. They fell every year, all the way till 2018. They only climbed back up to, to, to the 13-14 level of merchant, merchandise exports in dollar terms in 2018-19. So and it, with the pandemic and the collapse of the global economy, we don't expect exports to be growing. What is left? The fourth engine, fiscal policy, public expenditure. On account of the slowdown in the economy, the, a, a silent fiscal crisis had already crept up on this country, which, was, which the government was hiding, but the CAG actually revealed because in the in the last year before um, the pandemic, the government was claiming that our fiscal deficit is of the order of about 3.8% of GDP, but the CAG had already told us it was in fact 5.68% of GDP. So therefore, under the current circumstances, the government has to borrow more and spend on infrastructure, because that will crowd in public investment, sorry, private investment. Second, finally, the government needs to commit to a 2.5% of GDP investment in the next three years to help. India is one of the few countries in the low middle income category, which spends only 1.15% of GDP on health. Our public health infrastructure is weak. How are we going to immunize 60 to 65 percent of our population, which is what is needed to achieve herd immunity? And we should clearly be aiming at to achieve that, you know, immunize 60 to 65 percent of our population by 2022. But does our public health system actually have the capacity to do that? Let me give you a sense of how many million children are actually vaccinated every year. There are 150 million children in, who are under five. They are supposed to be vaccinated every year. 
we managed to vaccinate only 65% of our children. That means we managed to vaccinate on a normal year 100 million children. But we need to vaccinate, I'm saying, two-thirds of our population, which is 800 million plus. Can you imagine how we can do this without investing more in interest on, 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 on human resources and the infrastructure of health? That is why the, 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 uh, Dr. N. K. Singh, the chairman of the Finance Commission, has rightly pointed out that we need to increase, come, finally come good on our national health policy of 2017, this government's national health policy, to increase public expenditure on health to 2.5% of GDP, not by 2025 as the national health policy says, but by 2023, 20, hopefully, because that's also a job creating strategy. Health is a highly labor intensive activity. Third, we need an urban employment guarantee. Why do we need an urban employment guarantee? I mean, I welcome the government's sort of greater investment in Manrega, but the fact is that these are work, workers. The demand for Manrega is in excess of what the government is able to supply despite the increase in expenditure. And if you increase expenditure on a public health system, oh, sorry, on, on, on urban employment guarantee, it will be substitutive of Manrega. In other words, you'll, you could very well be saving resources by not spending on Manrega because you will pull workers back and, 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 and create reasonable infrastructure in tier two, three, four cities if you did up an urban employment guarantee. So in other words, it will not cost more it, or it will cost only as much as you're spending on Manrega in any case or the additional that you will have to spend next year or the additional that you've had to spend in, in 2021, you don't need to spend, you could spend that this in, in FY22 on an urban employment guarantee. And finally, I would say, this is a crisis of demand. Aggregate demand has collapsed because joblessness has increased. Even in the organized sector, 18 million people were laid off in this, in this financial year. And those who are left behind, they've seen a decline in, in, in salaries. Although the open unemployment rate doesn't seem to be that much higher than what was prevailing in 2019, this is, uh, uh, this is if anyone thinks that you know, the, the, the economy is reviving or we are seeing a V-shaped recovery, is living in cloud cuckoo land because all these in the informal sector are, are, are stating you know the CMIE estimates. The CMIE estimates are showing very clearly that those in the informal sector are saying two things. A, that they are working, the self-employed, the casual workers are working fewer hours and fewer days in the week and at wages which are lower. How, why are we surprised? Because millions have gone back to rural areas. Rural wages have, have been collapsing. And that has had a ratchet effect, a knock-on effect on urban, urban wages. Therefore, the implication is that the government needs to put in place a minimum income guarantee. I've written a paper on this. It's on the website of ICRIA. The, uh, the uh, minimum income guarantee essentially means substitute PM Kisan 500 rupees per month, which is meant exclusively for who? Owner cultivators only. In rural areas, only for owner cultivators. Tenant farmers don't get the PM Kisan 500 rupees a month. Landless labor don't get anything. If the rural non-farm poor don't get anything, the urban poor don't get anything. So I would argue for, an, uh, for a minimum income guarantee for roughly half of our nation's population, which is poor, and no more than 500 rupees a month. Between the four actions that I'm suggesting, a pub increase in public investment, an increase in health expenditure, and an urban employment guarantee, and a minimum income guarantee, which substitute PM Kisan, please understand. And my estimate of this minimum income guarantee is that you can provide this to, to, to all the groups that I mentioned, while still including most of the, the, the owner cultivator farmers and still spend only 10,000 crores per, per annum more, 
than what you are spending on PM Kisan. In other words, this is a feasible and perfectly uh, uh, fiscally responsible scheme that I'm speaking about. If the government, uh, it's not that urban employment guarantee was not considered. They rejected it in the most recent Atmanirvar 3. They rejected even um, this, this cash transfer. Why? We were never told. So I'm hoping that in the budget, all these three things will be taken seriously and we will begin to see a serious fiscal stimulus. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Marotra, for uh, putting across so many points. Utpal sir is having some connection issues. Hello? Uh, yes, Utpal sir, yes, go on. Uh, hello? Yes, sir, some voice. Uh, so you can, we can hear you. Thanks a lot. You, it is uh, brief, audible, but no sweet problem. lecture. We all know, uh, sir, sir. So, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Can you can you hear me? Yes, yes, yes. Okay. So 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 it is okay now. Yes, but Utpal sir, uh, right. We'll come back to you. But uh, for the interest of time, it is we... okay now. No, no, Utpal sir. Let me uh, let me. Uh, get on the deliberation. Am I audible? No, not Am much. I audible? No. Or just, just give a ring, Arjun? Yes, I am, I am continuing, no problem. Ish. Am I audible? No. Okay. Yes, you, yes, you're audible, okay. Utpalda, you're audible. Okay. Okay, Arjun, please continue. I am yes. joining soon. Yes, thank you. So, uh, Professor Devanathan, if you like to say yeah, anything. Yeah, then uh, oh, uh, I, I, uh, <coughs> Okay. Urgent. <coughs> yes. yes, Professor Devanathan, you can say. Okay, okay. Can I'll, just say a few okay. Words. I'll just say a few words. I think what Santosh has put forward is a very, well, we know his analysis, but it's a very clear statement of the kind of issues that we are facing and what really is needed in terms of a policy response. I would just raise one problem is why are we not getting that kind of policy response? What is the political economy issue behind the kind of policy that we are seeing from the government of India? I think that's an important question. And I would like to suggest that we are moving in a certain direction, in a certain political economy direction, one where, <clears throat> well, it was there earlier too, but it has become stronger now. The responsibility for taking care of any problems of social security because of economic downturns is being put on the rural economy. This happened in 2008 also when the Narega was strengthened because of the, uh, of the fall in say, the employment in the diamond cutting and other such export oriented sectors, which fell as a result of the 2008 recession. This happened in Asia in the 1990s, in the 1997, 98, uh, the financial crisis when there was some manner of that there really was little social security provided and therefore you found uh, we were in Bangkok at that time and I remember a large number of urban workers who lost their jobs going back to villages so this is not something new this has been continuing it's only this time we saw it on a scale that has never been seen before I mean and, and, and in a kind of cruel manner which has never been seen before because of the way the lockdown was conducted. And we had the site which we all saw on our TV screens of people walking back hundreds of kilometers back to their homes. So this is the first political economy question we have to face, that there is a strong 
move a continuation of a policy of putting the responsibility of providing a social security net to the rural economy. Now, this happens not only in a, so the social security net in a macroeconomic sense, but it also happens in a microeconomic sense. Because when we look at, say, something like garment workers and other low paid workers in the economy, you find that they do not work in the urban areas for all through the year, first thing. They go back for a couple of months every year. Secondly, when they fall sick, they go back home because they're not able to manage their uh, expenditures in, in the urban where, when they don't work, when, they're, when they lose their jobs. And thirdly, when they retire also, they go back home. So the, a large part of the cost of, pro, of providing labor, of taking care of the social reproduction of labor is really borne by the rural economy. We see this now coming out in a very, in a very stark manner at the time of the crisis. So that is the first point of the political economy, that there is a clear policy that there will be nothing given at the bottom level of the economy. They will have to manage and they will have to manage on their own. In this period, you will also notice even something as small as the LPG uh, subsidy was also withdrawn. And nobody knew what was happening, why it was happening. And suddenly those poor women who were getting a few hundred rupees, uh, it has been, <coughs> it was withdrawn. And I'm sure the new data will show that there is a shift towards the utilization of solid biomass as fuel because of the withdrawal of the LPG subsidy. So that's the first point of the political economy. The second point of the political economy is that there is a emphasis on not just the large scale sector, but what may, we may call the hyperscale sector, hyperscale enterprises. So you have the growth of very large oligopolies or monopolies, whichever way you put it, that the growth of the monopolies and different sectors of the economy, which were already given a benefit, a boost before the pandemic struck <coughs> in terms of reductions in corporate taxes and reductions in taxes at the upper level, which would uh, leave more of their profits and their money in their own hands. So there is a two aspects to the political economy, which are going to drive the manner in which we come out of the crisis. One is that the poor will be given very little. There for them, there will be a market fundamentalism. You will only get what you get on the market. And secondly, for the oligopolies of the country, there will be more and more support given, whether it is through through infrastructure or in other ways, it'll, or even through the banking system, it will not be that for the MSME sector, it will really be for the large sector, which will be able to utilize all of the uh, all of the loans in that manner. So we're going to have, I would say, as a result of this political economy approach of our government, we're going to have a very unequalizing growth. We may go back in two or three years to a reasonable level of growth. As Santosh pointed out, our, G, our, our per capita income has fallen to levels that they were in 2016, or, or was it 15? Anyway, they've fallen a few years back. So, so they will take a couple of years to recover. We may get growth after that, but it will be a very unequalizing growth, perhaps the most unequal kind of growth that any country has witnessed. And that is what we are coming in for. So I would just make a, these, two remark, these two remarks with regard to the type of political economy which is developing in India. And uh, I think that this complements what Santosh was pointing out. I'm just trying to explain why we're adopting a certain, why our government is adopting a certain kind of policy, first in the pandemic itself, and secondly, as we try to come out of it. Thank you, Arjun. I think we can now go to the discussants who are waiting to, uh, to give their comments on the very useful lecture by Santosh Merotra. Yes. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Nathan. So, uh, uh, very nice uh, uh, lecture. Yes, we can uh, go ahead. So, let me go to the first panelist uh, for the discussion for this special lecture, Professor Sarthi Acharya. Uh, sir, why don't? Sir also manages 
the Indian Journal of uh, Labor Economics as a managing editor and also a professor at uh, Institute, Delhi Chair Professor at Institute for Human Development in Delhi. So why don't you go, please? Uh, thank you, Arjun, uh, for uh, inviting me to this stimulating lecture by, by Santosh and uh, the comments by Dave, who's a colleague with us in the Institute. <clears throat> Uh, Santosh has given an excellent sequencing of events with hard data to back what he said. But uh, I would like to really split the whole argument into two, the structural issues and the current issues which the country is facing. And when we talk about structural issues, we cannot really say that 2014 is really, really a break point in the economy because it doesn't happen that way. We had problems in 13, that's why 14 happened. We had problems in 12, that's why we had mass crisis in 13. So there has been problem in the economy for a while. And frankly, at the cost of being almost naive, I would say, we started deindustrializing de this country, the second deindustrialization back in the 1990s, when again, we suddenly opened up the economy like we have done with agriculture now that Without discussion, we opened up the agriculture sector. We did the same thing in 1991, out of compulsions or whatever. We didn't have an industrial policy. We didn't have an R&D. We just opened up the economy and the industry started collapsing. And many people have noted that lakhs and lakhs of jobs were lost during that period, never to be gained again. The textile industry, industry shut down. What we gained were a large number of modern industries. Yes, we gained them because we tried to plug it to the International Division of Labor. But what did we gain? We gained the lower end of those jobs which the US wouldn't do, which Europe wouldn't do. So we got a large number of jobs which were primarily at the uh, low-end services, back-end jobs, gig jobs, construction activities, which, okay, Santosh may add them up to 50 million or 60 million. That's very, that's a true. Those numbers are very correct. But we're talking about jobs of three and 400 rupees a day. And we're talking about those kinds of jobs, which uh, uh, Dave had said, don't, don't last for a full year. People go back. So we are talking about job creation, which did actually reduce poverty. He's right. We reduce poverty. But our poverty line is at what level? Is at level of basic food, 2,200 calories per day, per day, per person, plus a little amount of uh, uh, non-food uh, component, which is about 30% of that. Look at the health sector. Health sector has been privatized left, right, and center since the, 19, uh, the 1990s, and so has the education sector. So the, all those expenses are really not counted in the poverty lines. If we start counting the poverty line, the poverty line will not be what it is right now. And hence, to talk about 20% below poverty line may really be an understatement. So there is a structural component which uh, which we can't ignore, which has contributed to the uh, multiplication of the current crisis. So <clears throat> let me now come to the fact how unemployment has grown. Yes, unemployment has grown in the post-2010 period. It has been growing, but the numbers could be much higher because the labor force participation has fallen down. Now look at the situation like this. We are creating jobs, as I said a little while back, at the lower end. So if jobs are created, for example, in Ahmednagar or Nasik, and if there's surplus labor in, uh, in uh, UP, Bihar, these jobs are created at something like four and 5,000 rupees, 6,000 rupees a month. It's not the same as in the US, for example, where people from the central uh, states traveled to the coastal areas to settle down uh, in search of jobs when US was industrializing rapidly. It's not the same because the four and 5,000 rupees a month does not give you a livelihood in Nase, a thousand miles away from where you are. So as a result, a large number of women dropped out because they were not mobile, not definitely not mobile to work in these kinds of uh, low-end jobs in places so far away. So we have a situation which is, which is uh, pretty, uh, I would say, uh, difficult right now. And what has COVID done? COVID has really hit at that very sector which we were talking about, that very sector where jobs were created, construction sector, back-end jobs, gig jobs, 
and further the industrialization which has been happening in our economy which everybody knows i don't have to say that our industrial component has never increased much beyond the 15 16% of the uh, of the gdp while china or other countries southeast asia have have been well above this well about 25 30% so we have a serious problem there so people have been going back so covid has really you know created problems with those very people who were really already suffering so what do we do in this situation does the finance minister have leverage to do anything what we have done so far which the prime minister has offered me talking about we gave how much 20 lakh crore did we really give 20 lakh crores the answer is clearly no because we created a lot of situation where monetary component of policy had been given a boost which means banks were asked okay why don't you lend why don't you give money to people they didn't do it so as santosh rightly said we didn't give much more than 2% compared to what was given in uh, the in uh, 2007 8 which is or 8 9 which is about three times four times that <clears throat> so what the finance minister really could do now is provide a true fiscal stimulus which puts money in people's hands and those people's hands who need the most who would spend and possibly create a demand impetus in the economy so that's that's one component how do you create a situation where people get money in their hands and they spend that money so that there is a demand created the second is right at our nose what do what, what do we do about agriculture do we keep on feeding agriculture the way it is <clears throat> the fact is that we make policies that in the next 4 hours this is going to happen next 3 days this is going to happen yes agriculture does need a change but not the way the things have happened we need a transition we need a policy which will transit agriculture from its current state of of uh, affairs which means a lot of uh, inefficiency because of excessive water use because of uh, price uh, uh, distortions to a situation where we could become more efficient and uh, competitive but for this we need a definite policy again like we as i said a little while ago we need an industrial policy here we need an agriculture policy and these policies are not ones which happen in four hours intervals these have these have to be properly graduated to be rolled out over 2 3 4 5 years period taking people with the nation and the policy rather than uh, taking them by surprise the third thing is <coughs> a strong impetus is necessary for our smes now smes are the backbone as far as employment is concerned and these need a boost there are shutdowns in smes reported of unprecedented order and this is where i think a lot of money has to go in for uh, uh, them to come back the fourth is the value added export component as they had said some time back okay certain industries which were facing problem diamond cutting and these kind of thing but these are not the ones which are high tech industries these are conventional industries we have what is our export it's uh it's raw materials iron uh, yeah, or iron or manganese or and a lot of these uh, you know low end jobs like uh, the diamond cutting and to an extent textiles but that too in the lower end so i mean we need value added component and for which the budget this year and the next year and the following year will have to do something about it which means uh, i'll be brave to say bring back five year plans yes we do need five year plans which will put some of these things in a five year perspective and try to bring some of these policies back on the uh, rails and uh, finally i would say <clears throat> there is huge investment required in human capital our workers are as most business magazines will say less than a fifth of our graduates are employable r and d is virtually nothing these are things which are structural but at the same time they show up as very stark when we face crisis like this uh and therefore uh, even if the results don't show up in one or two years they will show up in five years if we start investing in some things yeah thank you thank you mr chairman thank you with <coughs> pastor would you like to check yes if you can unmute so uh, ultimately i could join now so thanks a lot uh, the connectivity i got from another mobile mobile of my wife's <laughs> anyway so so many uh, hitches here 
So uh, as as sir is right, uh, Professor Mehrotra, I, I I did not mention that uh, sir has a lot of writing earlier on the demographic dividend that today also he mentioned, and also universal education and that issues related to that. So he started his lecture with some unemployment issues and he rightly mentioned here that that every everybody is uh, blaming uh, the um, lo lockdown and this pandemic issues for the rising unemployment. It is not that from onwards after 2016, we saw there is a downfall and gradual downfall. And what was the growth before that? Almost 8% per annum. And just now it is just opposite. It got reversed uh, in the 2002 when the pandemic started. But it does, did not happen all on a sudden. There was a slow downfall because of some economic policies, which they were expecting that in the long run, it will yield some benefit. Though in the short run, there are some uh, glitches uh, like that of uh, not bandi or demonetization, whatever you say, along with that uh, hasty implementation of the GST and on other issues of the that is on uh, on on privatization and planned of so many things that happen. So that has havoc impact not only on the formal sector but more and more on the informal sector. So that he was right, and he wrote a, a series of um, papers on that. And thereafter, sir had. Um, only that pandemic added salt to the injury that we can say. It is just added, only accentuated. And then he also uh, talked about the educational side and the plight on the girls' issues and, and the dependencies on these things. But uh, simultaneously, uh, Professor Mehratra here mentioned that, that uh, when we are thinking to go for a further and further development, that happens to a switch over from agriculture to a non-agricultural economy more. So to pull out the laborers from agriculture, like that of the, uh, the, the policies of the Lewis and other frameworks that should go, rather after the pandemic and has to implementation of this lockdown measures So what we saw, that initial for a few days, one and two months, people could tolerate, but when it gone out of proportion, they started going back to the villages and joined the same agriculture with their limited plots of lands for which they had earlier migrated to town. So what happened, there was a rise in disguise unemployment initially, and many people did not find appropriate job regularly and with appropriate uh, wages that you can say. So we, we found across the country, so many reports came that that while going back because of the non-availability of the transport, some people died, this, that. So through the lockdown, how many life we saved, we don't know. But because of that, again, going back with, without much facilities initially, so many people died and it increased again the inequality. Even in this pandemic, when the economy is going down, we saw that two, three or few uh, uh, industrialists, their income has increased enormously at the global level, their status has been elevated. So that's why I also said there that uh, this pandemic, when online classes, everything has started. So people should have gone for the revival of the BSNL. So there was a chance of capitalizing the situation to give some facilities to the people and this company could generate employment. Instead, BSNL, uh, there it gone down only that uh, Geo and others, and today you can see that I could not contact and connect your program even through Geo. I have two connectivity with the Geo, but still I could not. Only money is going, so I don't know how it is helping the welfare and this all uh, online businesses. That is the thing. So the, the, I, I fully agree with sir, sir, and 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 that is that that four points he has mentioned here. That um, that uh, how the hasty lockdown is implemented. And what extent we should have uh, uh, we should have received the stimulus package from the government on what aspect? As in one of my writing, also I mentioned that only at very low interest uh, loans will be given without any collateral. But unless there is a proper market sentiment, how people will utilize the same uh, 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 to go for the business? because the market sentiment, we, we can see that after 2016, so much of uncertainty, people are uh, scared also. Many, many big industrialists also raised today only. One of my writing came in the Economic Times regarding that. 
that uh, that that they are uh, they are now scared so who will come forward to invest uh, in this situation so the, these are the things so uh, some more issues uh, 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 may come up but before um, uh, uh, going into that further i i request uh, um, uh, professor uh, here professor indira hire is uh, writing here that she cannot hear properly so instead i can go directly to uh, professor amrita pillai so who ha i had given a small introduction about uh, professor amrita pillai who is a, by um, profession a lawyer and he is a policy is a policy researcher and now engaged at nipfp so i i would like to hear see also worked in different capacities at undp and i uh, unicef etc so just uh, please give your comment on uh, professor mehrotra's lecture and uh, if you have any query please Thank you, Thank you, Professor. Um, I suppose I might have to keep my video off because of bandwidth issues. So, in the interest that my voice comes through without breaking, I'm just going to uh, keep it off. I apologize for this. But uh, firstly, I'd like to begin by saying that I'm delighted to be part of this talk. Thank you, Dr. Kumar, for inviting me here, and thank you, Professor Merotra, for a wonderful session. Uh, I, in fact, uh, intend building on what you said about uh, um, you know creating more non-farm jobs. um and i'm going to uh, briefly uh, dwell upon what the budget 2021 could do for the msms um so i'll begin with that now um uh, there are around 6 crore odd unincorporated non agricultural units together um which are the second largest employer in the country so um um essentially this labor intensive sector employs approximately 11.4 crore persons um and of the total msmes in the country we know that more than 99% are micro units within them of course the predominant share is of units which are owner managed or self employed and the next highest share is of units which employ up to five workers um these are informal units we know that informality is not just to do with these businesses but also to do with the precarious relationship that these businesses have with their workers uh, it is defined by low and stagnant wages as professor merotra has already highlighted and the lack of social security um to begin with what the budget 2021 could do um regarding the vacuum in terms of detailed and full information on the sector um considering it is such a salient sector to the economy um and that the fourth and last census was conducted as far back as in 2006 7 um it could allocate money towards conducting a fifth census of the msmes uh, current information is captured by sample surveys or in various online filing systems of the government such as the udyog aadhar memorandum the msme data bank or the gstn uh, gstn only of course captures enterprises with a turnover of more than 40 lakhs so you know we can exclude that uh, the other two databases and the newest one the newest version of it which is the udyam uh, database captures only self certified and voluntary information so this is one of the things that the budget could do for the sector per se it is imperative because we we really don't know where the sector stands especially after the monetization gst and now the pandemic um next um in may the sector received a tailor made stimulus package that has been discussed here already it was largely credit centric and did not provide direct support to these businesses um in brazil for instance the government decided to pay part of the salaries of micro and small units um in countries such as canada new zealand uh, uh, the offered temporary wage subsidies uh, that were capped of course in india the government did not announce any wage support or subsidy package uh, to incentivize employers to retain workers during the crisis although it directed employees and commercial establishments to to you know sort of continue paying wages uh, and uh, uh, i must uh, uh, admit that the government did pay the epf contribution for specific establishments of course but since the epf and the miscellaneous provisions act uh, itself is presently applicable to only establishments with 20 employees or more uh, and we know that micro businesses uh, you know which comprise 99% of all msmes are known to have less than five workers this makes the small and informal economic units essentially rendered ineligible to have pf accounts for their workers and therefore they are excluded from availing this relief measure um germany uh, offered a direct subsidy to one person businesses and micro units and uh, um given the vast number of you know such units that we have it was expected that the package would do something for them um in fact the stimulus package did not take into cognizance uh, first time borrowers at all 
um, at least in this budget, the hope is that you know the government will consider int introducing a package for uh, first-time MSME borrowers. A credit backstop will need to be provided by the government uh, with a timely claims process in place. And this initiative can also be used as a channel to formalize many more MSMEs, uh, new ones, and encourage entrepreneurship at least in these times. And the fund, of course, you know, this package can be administered by SIDB if at all. Um, one of the next points I'd like to uh, comment upon would be the ECLGS. Uh, the largest share of the stimulus package was plugged into the emergency credit line guarantee scheme. Um, this, however, is still only applicable for units with a 25 crore loan outstanding and turnover of up to 100 crore. It has been extended until March 31st, 2021, but as of November 2020, at least we only know that uh, uh, a little less than half the amount, which is around 1.52 crore, 1.52 lakh crores, if I'm not wrong, has been disbursed. Um, this scheme, uh, in my opinion, should be extended. And a portion of the remainder, the banks should be mandated to disburse to micro and small enterprises. Another crucial addition um, could be establishing a commission to review and rationalize compliance requirements for MSMEs. Um, ease of doing business for large enterprises is, you know, the government seems to be very gung-ho about it, but not so much for the small ones. Um, the blueprint of the Labor Commission that rationalized the central labor codes recently may be used, and states will also have to be encouraged to do the same. Um, if EODB for small businesses has to be taken seriously, a heavy compliance burden, as is in our country today, it forces enterprises to start off as informal units. And invariably, they are, you know, compounded by lower productivity, employing as few workers as possible to bypass certain laws, uh, you know, and hence, you know, do not require to provide social security to their workers or even pay them minimum wages. So these redundant and duplicate compliance items will need to be identified and rationalized on the basis of simply necessity and proportionality. Uh, so that is uh, one item that the budget could consider. Um, the last and important point uh, I had was regarding women's employment. The package did not have anything specific for this segment of the workforce. Uh, the PLFS 2017-2018 uh, notes that between 2011-12 um, and 2017-18, uh, the workforce participation rate, the WFPR has declined for both genders in rural and urban uh, areas. However, this decline was the steepest for female workers in rural areas. Um, as we know, the presence of female workers is quite low in the MSME sector. Out of the 11 crore odd workers, um, I think only 24% are female as per the NSS, um, the 73rd round. Uh, and of these, we know that 52% work in rural areas. Um, the recent changes in labor laws uh, proposed by various state governments is only expected to push more women out of the workforce. And the reasons will range from, you know, likely suspension of uh, maternity and equal remuneration benefits, uh, uh, reduced employer accountability, uh, extended working hours, shelving of double wages for overtime worker, and so on and so forth. Um, the MSMEs led by women are seen to be dominant in the textiles and apparel sector, uh, as for the fourth and last uh, MSME census. And um, for such sectors where their participation is particularly high, some specific package may be envisaged. Um, of course, you know, I'm cognizant of the fact that to provide a fill-up to female employment in general, a combined effort from the state and central government will be required because uh, the suboptimal performance of central government initiatives targeted at women and MSMEs, I mean, be it the PMEGP, the Employment Generation Program, the TRED, uh, there has been a decline in women beneficiaries in the recent past. Mudra is in fact the only program where the segment has seen some progress. Um, so uh, measures to stabilize growth um, across commercial sectors must address the specific needs of women, whether they are workers or entrepreneurs in the MSME sector. So these are some other points uh, I wish to uh, add to what Professor Merotra has already, uh, you know, commented upon. Thank you. Sure, sure. So, uh, Santosh, sir, why don't you just reflect on some of those? Then we can, yes, go one round again for some. Yes. Uh, sir, sir, would you like to respond now or take yes. all the questions together? No, uh, sir, let Santosh, sir, respond to. Okay. okay. There are so many till now. Yes. Yeah. 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 Well, okay. I'm, I'll try and be as brief as possible. Those are uh, very useful comments, and honestly, I have uh, uh, very little to disagree with. Um, 
Uh, let me respond very quickly to the political economy point that Devanathan began with. Um, my sense, uh, Dave, is the following. That in the five to six years that this government has been in power, <coughs> it has a very clear vision of where it wants to put public money. Whatever will fetch votes is what has been prioritized. What do I mean by that? The Pradhan Mantri Awas Yojana has been absorbing a very significant amount of money and that has generated a lot of low-cost rural housing. Ghar mil gaya. Or then uske alawa ek shochale mil gaya. So sanitation saw a massive increase in allocations, just, just as what used to be called Indra Avas Yojana became Pradhan Mantri Avas Yojana. And the allocation in the, pre, in the last three years of, U, of NDA 1 was actually 30,000 crores per annum, which is a, which is a quantum leap from the, what used to be allocated for Indra Avas. Similarly, for Ujjwala, the third, gas mil I mean, um, I've learned from dealer organizations that now we are in a situation where 96% of the to of all households in our country have a have a gas cylinder and a gas has a gas stove regardless of whether they use it or not whether they can afford to buy it, buy the unsubsidized gas or not that's a different matter these are tangibles which have been handed over on the contrary health has seen a stagnation Education has seen a stagnation. ICDS has seen a stagnation. Midday meals have seen a stagnation in allocations. Because if growth is not happening, revenues are obviously, tax revenues are, in, are not increasing at a significant pace. The government is committed to a fiscal consolidation path. And if it's still committed to spending on quote unquote welfare measures, then something has to give, and that is what has given. Let's, in other words, the vision has been, let's focus on what fetches votes. And uh, Dave, you're absolutely right. What we are going to see is a K-shaped recovery. And we are seeing the evidence of that already in Q1, if we saw some, you know, manufacturing being positive in FY21. Why was that the case? Because that because corporate profits, you know, listed companies' profits rose by a very significant proportion, and this is this was simply building on a trend. Because what has happened uh, is that while, if you look at the composition of savings in the economy, uh, which consists of a household savings, b corporate savings, and third government savings. So household savings were systematically falling because joblessness was increasing between 20, um, uh, uh, 13, 14, when it was 24% uh, of GDP, it had fallen in 1819 to 17% of GDP. So on the one hand, household savings is dropping, but corporate savings in that same period went from 9, 9.5% 9 to 11.5% in 2019. On top of this, we've had corporate uh, profits rising in this, in this financial year. Very quickly on Sarthi, I just wanted to say, you know, while, you know, there's no question that there is a policy break from 2014. And we do know that between 2003, 4 and 14, 2014, the average growth, despite the slowdown post 2012, was 8% per annum, precisely 7.9% per annum for over a 10 year period. So there is a slowdown in the global economy post 2012. And yes, this government inherited a, a double balance sheet problem of corporate balance sheets and, ba and bank balance sheets. But on account of its own mismanagement, as the liquidity of the banks had risen, the banks, and because private borrowings were not, pri corporate borrowings was not, were not increasing, what did the banks do in order to keep generating profits? They lent to NBFCs. 
So NBFC lending increased, which on lended to MFIs and which on lended particularly to construction sector. But, the, but because, global, because the consumption was not rising, therefore housing demand was not rising. And the result was you had two additional balance sheets, as Arvind Subramaniam has rightly pointed out, where the NBFC's cr crisis broke upon us and the construction sector was crashing all around us in the last four or five years. So the point I'm making is that there is a certain break that happens post-24. And by the way, unemployment has not grown since 2020, 2010. Actually, employment in the non-farm sector grew very sharply between 2009-10 and 2011-12. It's post-2012 that, in fact, you began to see some slowing down. And I couldn't agree more on your industrial policy point. I mean, I have a paper in uh, 2020, I think, in the Indian Journal of Labor Economics. And what is tragic is that despite all the talk about make in India, the tragedy is that while uh, manufacturing share of GDP was about 17% in 1992, and remain till the, to that level till about 2014-15, in the last three years, it has actually fallen to 15% of, of, of GDP, from 17 to 15, despite make in India. And the share of manufacturing and employment has actually fallen in the last five or six years. And while PLI is good, the, pro, the performance linked incentive, I'm I'll, we'll, I'll, I'll wait to see what the, what the outcome is, uh, because it's just a sectoral policy. And, and you and I know, and you and I have written on this, that a sectoral policy is not what we need, or a sectoral alone policy is not what we need by, by industrial policy. Because we, uh, by industrial policy, we mean a broad-based policy. And I don't have the time to go into it. I couldn't agree with, more with you on uh, on the five-year plan point, I mean, I, I was so upset by the de demolition of the planning commission that I ended up doing a book about a year ago with Cambridge University Press. Because what did the plans do? What did the planning commission do? Why did it exist? It had two functions. One, in the plan, it articulated a vision, a vision which had been, uh, had been arrived at by the political leadership of the of the central government but in consultation with the states this consultation process used to go on for a whole year it was a very deep consultation process that vision was reflected in the five year plan and second then money was put behind the plan there were there were annual plans it was not just a five year plan there were projects and programs associated with it I'm one of the, you know, uh, uh, I'm a critic of the, of the planning commission, the way it was run and so on. But I'm a stronger critic of what, what became of it, which is Niti Aayog, which is, which is barely a shadow of what it was. This country needs vision, formulation, and not a single East Asian country has abandoned five-year planning. While under the neoliberal influence of the bank and the fund, Latin America did, Africa did, and they lost two decades. The Asians did not. None of the Asian countries abandoned five-year planning. So, uh, you know, um, and by the way, I, I mean, finally, Amrita's points, I couldn't agree more. I agree with you entirely. However, just wanted to say that, you know, there is more information uh, available about MSMEs post-pandemic than you might think. Uh, the, there is the, the association of, of MSMEs, and there is another association in the South, uh, IMO, All India Manufacturers Association. They have been, they have been uh, uh, in survey after survey over the course of the pandemic of their constituent organizations, and they have about 5,000 organizations, saying that one third of the MSMEs are on the verge of closing down. And that is not surprising. And all the sort of liquidity that has been created and all the cre um, credit guarantees, et cetera, that has been, have been provided has not resulted in holding them from collapsing because demand is collapsing all around them. So, so 
the reason why I go back to my point about the, using fiscal policy to generate aggregate demand in the economy is if that had been happening this year, you wouldn't see so many MSMEs, you know, completely di disappearing. Um, and I couldn't agree more with you about SIDB. SIDB needs to be strengthened. Um, no question about it. Thank you. Back to you, Professor Day and Dave. Yeah. Um, th thanks, uh, sir. Uh, de definitely, uh, you, you have rightly pointed out one thing that um, more liquidity in the banks and where to spend it. They did not find the ways. And so, uh, given loan to the construction sector through the uh, uh, NBFCs and others. And, and what we see also, these construction sectors also uh, has a huge setback. So they cannot sell the buildings also or the apartments. So now uh, rising more non-performing assets that, that has come down. And so uh, that, uh, as I was telling in the market, so people are scared that how can they go for new, new, more startup or a new, newer small MSMEs and where to sell the product. How many people who gone back to the suburbs or the rural areas open the tea stall or all these things so they cannot do. So what is the survival? And, and, and about your uh, comment on this, that abandoning the five-year plan that has a constructive long run uh, that uh, impact that uh, if we invest now after gestation, some uh, things will come and continuous process of these discussions through which this uh, process was evolved. Now every uh, you, now it is going like a ad hoc allocation annual. So the, before the allocation, six months used to go, four, five, six months, and then money used to be allocated. And before it comes October, November, there is hardly any time to spend. So all the educational and other institutes also suffering uh, from the same issues. I, I don't know how, but there is a question came in this uh, uh, chat box. I saw that direct cash transfer and the investment in the infrastructure on the part of the government, as many people are uh, uh, means are going to go in favor of that so that there will be a rise in expenditure capability and market will be revived. So whether it will go be a, a raise the fiscal deficit beyond a certain limit. And if that happens, uh, then uh, then how the, the thing will be man manageable that uh, yeah, it may have the negative impact. But, but simultaneously, there is another question on my part also, that what can we say that when we see there is a negative growth and simultaneously there is inflation, negative growth, people are uh, expenditure capability declined and despite that prices are going up. So we, ca we can see. And what is the consequence? that uh, monthly 500 rupees are given uh, to the hands of the people. And next day that 500 are going back from their pocket because inflation is so high. Where uh, 15 rupees potato, they are buying at 60 rupees or 50 rupees kg. So onion, every, every items uh, price has gone up 30 to 40 percent of the daily expenditure items. So you give a little money in their pocket to rise the enhance their expenditure capability and next day immediately take back that money whether it is going to government or going to the uh, business people, whoever uh, is there. So how it is actually helping them in that way. So that is, that is uh, another thing. And another way you told that, that emphasis on the, of the government that switched over, that uh, more, more of this of uh, uh, low cost housing, at least for the provision that can be made to the mass scale population, they need housing definitely and the sanitation facilities, but uh, there is a stagnation on the education and healthcare sector. So which also has a huge direct impact on the human resources and sanitation definitely has through an indirect way impact on the human resources, which is more impact. Definitely there must be a balance uh, between these two that we, we expect. So I, I will expect some comment uh, in this regard from your side, uh, but, but simultaneously we will take some questions. Uh, there is a, uh, we have with us uh, Professor Indira Haroe and also another professor uh, who is chairman of the Department of Economics of Rajshahi University at Bangladesh. So Professor Abdul Wadud also joined uh, with us after Indira Hoye, I will also come to him. So because what is the differences in, the, uh, in, in handling the COVID situations and so that we can see that Bangladesh's economy became more resilient than the Indian economy despite being a big economy with a big uh, and, and there is an expectation that per capita income in that front, so Bangladesh may have little A's over India. So uh, before going to Professor Wadud, I, I will uh, request Professor Indira Haroe to give 
her uh, comment on on Professor Madhavta's uh, delivery or lecture today. Please go ahead. Can you hear me, Professor Hiroe? Yeah, I can hear you. Uh, please. Um, I have I have nothing much to say except that. Um, I mean, it's a very well organized discussion, all points covered and everything. But I would like to focus on political economy because I think that's something extremely important and that is something which is difficult to deal with. So I think that is something which has a political solution and that's why one has to think in terms of political solutions also, which is not in the purview of economics maybe. And second point which I would like to point out is the gender aspect of it because women have suffered the most in terms of unemployment, low wages, loss of jobs, everything, plus a burden on them, increased burden on them, and violence. So I think gender aspect needs to be focused also, because that's something very important. And I'm totally not prepared, but these two things came up very much, but I congratulate all of you to, uh, for dealing with this subject so well. Thank you so much. Thank you. So th th thanks a lot. Uh, so shall I ask uh, Professor uh, Abdul Wadud, are you present? Very I bad. think you have gone through the lecture of Professor Meratra. Yeah, I am here, yes. So any comment on your part, please? Uh, uh, thank you, Professor Paul, for giving me the chance to make comments on the overall discussion. The discussion was very, very impressive, very interesting, and very, I think, fruitful. And uh, the the panelist and the presenter uh, presented the whole issue, the whole uh, thing, and every aspects of the issue very, very clearly and very neatly. And as you told that the uh, economy of Bangladesh is is uh, uh, somewhat more resilient. Uh, although at the beginning of the pandemic, our informal sector uh, uh, was was hard, ha hardly heated. And nowadays, this informal sector has started again reviving and is uh, uh, started taking its, its 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 speed and its flow. And we are we are very happy, and like uh, uh, India, um, in Bangladesh also the the uh, severity of the pandemic is uh, is slowly going down, and our uh, different sectors are uh, started reviving. Our employment is uh, again uh, increasing day by day. Informal sector is again uh, taking its, uh, its speed and taking its. Uh, are taking its full, we can say that uh, full activities, but it will it, it still uh, take time, take few time, uh, take few time. But it, it is it is getting well again, and our uh, uh, banking sector is facing facing uh, some problems. We are facing some liquidity problems, and uh, because of the pandemic, as you know that the revenue collection, tax collection was not up to the expectation. And for that reason, we are also facing some problem in financing various uh, projects, various mega projects. And uh, and for that uh, reason, our development activities is, uh, is, is being done slowly. And we are, uh, we are, we are hoping that we shall uh, we shall soon overcome uh, these these problems. And as as we know that the the as the pandemic is is uh, in our country, uh, like other uh, South Asian countries, the effect of pandemic is uh, going down, and uh, most of the sectors in our countries in our country. Uh, is uh, are started uh, to uh, revive, and we hope 
that uh, within uh, if the uh, severity is of the pandemic uh, pandemic uh, in the future uh, is not um, not not in, in increase then uh, we shall be able to uh, able to revive or we shall be able to recover our economy within the next uh, next two or next next uh, one or two uh, years and uh, and we shall again i hope that uh, we get our expected growth rate at this moment we as we know that our growth rate has gone down our gdp growth rate has gone down it is about uh, about about um, about 5% although it was more than 8% nowadays it has gone down but we are expecting that within the next uh, two three years or uh, less than two, two years we shall be able to um, revive or we shall to able we shall be able to recover our economy and we shall be able to uh, get the expected growth rate of uh, growth rate of 8% or, or or more so uh, i am fishing okay thanks 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 a lot but uh, what fundamental differences in the handling of the pandemic in these two countries that you find that made the uh, differences in this outcome as uh, professor mehrotra is telling so uh, is, is is professor elias there yeah, I have. Uh, he is also yeah. a professor of economics at the, the Russian point, University. So I missed so the both of them. Lecture. So uh, I think if he can give a small comment on this, okay. Please. Go actually, ahead. I mi I missed the main presentation. So what was the main topic actually? I di I didn't know. Is the basically informal sector employment, unemployment, labor issues related to this pandemic and what to do in future. Uh, what you are doing and what India is doing, sir has highlighted on many aspects the failure and success of the government's policies. There. Okay, then uh, then I can make a small comment that uh, actually uh, uh, the uh, in in Bangladesh uh, a, a bigger section of uh, labor force is employed in the unorganized sector, especially in the roadside business or footpath business or a small small. Uh, restaurants on uh, shopkeeping etc etc so these are the section uh, who is uh, was hardly hit by the uh, corona pandemic in bangladesh and you know our uh, government has uh, announced a 1 lakh and 25 crore taka uh, for incentives which was given to uh, several sectors like uh, large industry, ready-made garment industry, other industries, agriculture and service sector. And some uh, a part of these incentives are also uh, allocated for this unorganized sector as well. But however, uh, due to the problem of disbursement, because these people with unorganized sector uh, they don't have any uh, collateral to give or very difficult sometimes to identify. Uh, so the incentives But the same thing has been followed them, uh, in India also. In, in, system, uh, in Dhaka city, a good, a good number of these people have left Dhaka because their business uh, was, was collapsed. Uh, they could not maintain their life in a expensive city like Dhaka. So many of them has uh, left Dhaka. So they could not revive their business up to now. So right now, the two sectors that we could not revive is one is the unorganized sector and another is the tourism sector uh, where a lot of uh, people are still remain unemployment and they are suffering a very uh, struggling right, life right now. Thank you very much. Over so to tourism, you, sir. Tourism and the related um, uh, transport infrastructure, everything has been devastated in India too. And for the small sector or unorganized sector, that uh, were small loans, these policies India also followed. But it is not still that we are reviving anyway. So thanks a lot. 
so uh, i think rather um, we can go actually, to uh, actually what we did what we did is that uh, the the uh, bureaucrats are in charge of disbursing the incentives to these people so they, that Bureau system is not working well you want to able to find out this no problem sir in the interest of corruption well. yeah. behind that okay so okay. thanks 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 a lot uh, some similarity and some dissimilarity is there in handling the covid and also size of the economy matters here because of the huge population also handling and and the and the variations of the categories of the population that is another and political scenario in india that is also different from your country that will maybe another political economy any anyway uh, yes. and the diversities so yes. i i would like to dr simi mehta i think she is here no 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 dr simi oh, sir we also it's almost uh, dinner time we also okay okay then arjun please give your comment and then sir will finally wind up and professor devnathan will take over to conclude yes uh, professor sarthi uh, sir can also just give a half a minute thing and we can also go uh, to so thank you very much yes uh, professor santosh sir uh, for uh, touching upon so many uh, issues and uh, one issues uh, really pertaining to utpal sir also started with it today that the the today's news was really the contraction of the economy so so what is your expectation that the number would be around 200 crores a uh, less or earlier it was 208 uh, crore, uh, lakh crores so what will be the actual numbers coming out uh, i am asking this because the last year budget was 28 lakh crores so what in and our macro economy has been really strong and sir you have been advocating that frbm and the others we should not look at so in absolute terms what uh, should we uh, as we see the growth also in the budget figures so would it be more than 30 lakh crores or what would be uh, an appropriate number as an indication uh, in your view which will be good for our economy so one that thing i really wanted to learn from you and uh, sir uh, you really suggested on the a uh, few things uh, really that uh, infrastructure we have to push health uh, and then also some urban cash transfer uh, or or cash transfer to giving uh, <clears throat> to you know those who are excluded because farmers are getting but uh, other workers cultivators those are also not getting same also so in the urban scenario uh, more, uh, many surveys we also did and uh, basant sir was also here from telegraph he also covered in city makers village makers the one of the most important demand uh, really or or the requirement is coming out to be the health uh, rightly so given this pandemic situation the other was really some requirement of cash and one thing i uh, really thought that we missed out was the digital divide because uh, uh, so what do you think uh, what kind of push should be uh, made uh, towards this infrastructure uh, that people also have access to things and uh, related to uh, this also then sir i thought to ask that so why are you uh, suggesting that we should not give more than 500 or uh, is there 500 any specific thing you have uh, uh, because i really also thought that uh, uh, can we also do better targeting and uh, uh, increase this amount and uh, the urban uh, urban scenario sir which you suggested so uh, was was will it also be uh for uh, households or per person 500 uh, as you were suggesting uh, like pm kisan pm kisan uh, goes to, for the household so uh, will this urban cash transfer be per person uh, we really suggested that per person 2000 very targeted thing and uh, do you think that the cash transfer would be required uh, uh, going ahead in the next fy so should the budget have some provision for that em emergency transfer like we did for under pradhan mantri garib garib kalyan yojana the janthan yojana 500 500 uh, 1500 we gave to uh, women janthan accounts and uh, uh, then sir what, what is your view about the national employment policy eight ministers committee was also formed uh, what should be done in that regard incorporating uh, the informal labor uh, because there is also a committee uh, professor kundi is co-chairing on informal labor and getting those data uh, really looking into it and uh, and largely related to that because i also wrote a paper in that came in ideas for india i looked into all the p pradhan mantri garib kalyan yojana not bosco and other things were also there then we have this atmanirbhar uh, uh, package of 20 lakh crore uh, but sir that was really uh, i would say reorientation of the budget uh, 
uh, in a way. So how do you see this time, this reorientation or the budget should really look, look at when we know what will be the, our challenges? And uh, uh, sir, what, what do you think of uh, the sources of finances should be? Uh, uh, Professor Arun Kumar really suggested that we should have a COVID-19 bond. Uh, many people are also suggesting that stock market is booming, so you can increase the wealth tax. Or uh, uh, Europe or others are also having a green bonds to finance their deficit. Uh, what, what do you think should be the way forward? And uh, uh, sir, one, uh, because it was also related to infrastructure, we also have national infrastructure pipeline. Uh, our finance minister is really pushing of, of 1.0 crore crore of or 1.5 trillion dollar. So how do you see that project coming up uh, for our infrastructure push? And uh, and sir, I will just uh, you know start uh, stop there. The role of tech economy and how we should have to be focused because India really is a, a service economy. And uh, what are the impediments toward uh, going towards manufacturing or make in India or SCZ? What uh, how we look at it? There are also some many programs, skill development, uh, uh, many job portals which has come, Mudra, MSME, street, for street vendors, we also have now something, some money we are giving. Uh, so, so, so many policies also uh, we have. Uh, but largely, I also like to see more of your work on the lockdown, which you really suggested that you're working on different facets of lockdown. Now also the cluster approach, UK and others are also having so that very interesting work. So I will stop here. You can choose to uh, uh, take uh, uh, anything and then we can just go to the way forward round uh, to uh, Sarthi sir and uh, to Sudev Nathan and you to just. Okay, sir Mehrutra, please. Okay, um, I, I'll try and be as brief as possible. Um, on my idea of the, of, uh, the minimum income guarantee of 500 rupees, it is, per household. I should say that I'm limiting it to 500 now, although uh, six months ago, I was arguing that for about three to four months, as when the lockdown is in place, every household could be given about 2000 rupees and then it could be reduced. And the reason why I'm uh, making a case for 500 is because this is what the government finds acceptable um, as in PM Kisan. Because there is a issue of you know, feasibility in terms of you know, fiscal cost. And I think what, you, what I, would all, I would urge you to do is to, is to read my ICRIA working paper uh, number 289 which was published in 2020 in, in, I think, April or May, and it's downloadable. And that makes a case for a certain design which is based on identifying households through the SECC, the Socioeconomic and Caste Census. And that would ensure better targeting than PM Kisan does. And that des the design and the architecture is very carefully laid out. I've even shared it with Dr. Rajiv Kumar. And it seems that they were discussing it, obviously, in, when the time came for Atmanirbhar 3. But they finally rejected it for whatever reason. I'll, 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 I'll leave you to sort of just read that paper of mine, and then we can, we can discuss if you wish. I'll just say a few words about this business of national employment policy. A year ago, or just over a year ago, we know that the Ministry of Labor had been considering it. Well, the Ministry of Labor and the, um, has been considering it through an interministerial committee uh, for five or six years, but it has not gone anywhere. And it has not gone anywhere, I'm reasonably certain, because of political economy reasons. And I don't think we have enough time at this hour at 7.50 p.m to go into the political economy reasons. <laughs> I would just again encourage you to look at two pieces of mine which came out with uh, Dr. Mahesh Vyas, the MD of CMIE, uh, in The Wire in quick succession. One was about the changes that need to be made in monetary policy, particularly this focus on inflation targeting 
which is damaging for growth uh, first and the second i think we need to uh, enable you know make some changes or amendments to the frbm as the economy recovers to allow the government to allocate certain funds which are specifically meant for job job creation <coughs> So anyway, have a look at those two pieces. And, and the third dimension of a national employment policy, which exists, by the way, in 44 countries. China has one. Korea has one. And I wish we had one. But clearly, our government doesn't think that it's worthwhile. Because that's why it has not happened. The third dimension, I would argue, is something that Sarthi was arguing for, and I've argued for, and which is this country needs a manufacturing strategy. It needs an industrial policy. It has not had one since 1991. Make in India is not a manufacturing strategy. And PLI is not a manufacturing strategy with all due respect. And what could be the seven or eight components of a manufacturing strategy for India? I've laid out in a, in a recent paper in 2020 of Indian Journal of Labor Economics. It's also available in my Cambridge University press book on planning. It's actually a whole a chapter is devoted to, man to manufacturing there and man what should be the components of a manufacturing strategy. So let me stop there. Um, I'm sure um, uh, Sarthi and uh, Devanathan have, 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 have much more to say. Thank you. Th th thanks a lot, sir. So now, uh, now for a small comment, Professor uh, Sarthi Acharya. Would you like to make any final comment? Well, since the time is running out, I would just say one or two points that the questions you had asked were so many that one would have to write a book on that, but that's <laughs> on the other side. Uh, <laughs> as far as the budget is concerned, to me, a budget is not something which is what is currently defined in terms of a policy which is implemented in, in four hours, one week, or 10 days. A budget is a, is a brick in a longer-term architecture. If we have a longer-term architecture in terms of five years or three years or whatever, to say this is where we want to go and work backwards, which is what the SDGs have also said, then the budget could be framed in such a way that we meet those targets. Now, okay, COVID is something which has happened out of the blue, but it's not that COVID is, going, COVID is going to last forever, but the country is, and it needs a long-term vision of how we go about. And in this context, your question about should we go beyond 20, 28 lakh crores? Yes, we must go beyond it. We can't be contracting the budget and expecting some kind of a you know, miracle happening in the economy. That's, that's fundamental. Uh, the other part is the digital divide, which you talked about, and that's the only thing I will comment upon. The digital divide is creating more problems than solving them. On the face of it, it says, yeah, we must have this, we must have this. How many of these machines are actually working? In fact, going to the field, and I go somewhat often these days after my retirement, and I notice that digital divide is creating more problems, particularly for those people who do not, uh, who haven't got any education in it. And we have noticed that Keeping money under the pillow is cheaper than keeping the money, keeping money in the bank. Now, that's a harsh statement to make, but that, that's a reality. Uh, so when we talk about a digital divide, again, we need some kind of a transition process of, of, of getting people on board when we talk about a policy and we just can't have a policy for a few people. And uh, well, I think I'll stop at that. Thank you. Thank, thank, thanks a lot. Uh, now. Uh, we, we are going towards that. We may get the potato chips also digital after a few days. All will be made of geo, geo, geo potato, geo thing, everything. Only that connectivity has gone. I, I had to use three mobile connectivity from Vodafone to Airtel, everything by trial and error. Finally, I could join here. So anyway, so the geo only taking money now. So now it is the finally final comments of the chairman, sir, Professor Devnathan. And okay. after your final comments, I think we should wind up, please. Please okay, go through. Thank you. Okay, it has yeah. been a very interesting discussion. I would, may, I would just make a couple of points. One, I would agree with what uh, Santosh said and also Sarthi. We very much need an industrial policy. 
And I agree, we've not had an industrial policy from 1991. It's not just now that we don't have it, we have not had it even then. We opened up without an industrial policy, therefore we could not replicate what China did. Now it has to be done in a different way. That's the important point. But we have moved in a very strongly market fundamentalist direction. There has been market fund fundamentalism for a while, but then we also had some measures like Narega coming up, the Forest Rights Act, Food Security Act, and so on, which gave some measures of support at the bottom. Now they are being withdrawn in the name of ease of doing business. Labor is also being pushed into a very completely market fundamentalist uh, situation. And I would only urge you, uh, most of the people here may be very young, to too young to remember this, but I was thinking, when have we had a policy of a similar kind? I can only one, find one parallel in history, and that was Pinochet's Chile, where also social security systems were withdrawn and there was a straightforward that the workers will only get what they get in the market and for the rest it will be for big business and we are having a very similar policy i think milton friedman's chicago boys would have done would have been very happy to see what is the policy now in india so we have a very strongly market fundamentalist policy which is to support big business and to leave labor and the working people to just uh, to to manage what what they will get in the market when we talk about the increasing inequality everybody has noticed that the uh, profits have increased but have you noticed on the other side that the savings of workers have been virtually wiped out a large part of provident fund has been withdrawn because they had to eat something whatever little savings people had on their own, those who don't have provident fund, that is gone. So people are left with no savings and a high profit for big business. That is the situation in which we are. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, oh. so we also have Okay, now Arjun, I think uh, whether sir will give a final comment or just you will wind up? Yes, yes, we'll, uh, we'll just, we'll go to uh, Santosh sir for a one minute. Uh, uh, way forward, but I really thought also to bring Sir's publication, which Sir was mentioning over No, this. no, no, this is, okay, I, I have two career working papers. This yeah. is not the one I was talking about. But I uh, have some more of your papers to, for display. Oh, okay, <laughs> <laughs> okay. We can come also to the wire article. Uh, well, I, I too have, I too have, I did not mention, because so many things, how many we can mention? No it is such an internationally named and... So many writing every often now, now and then every week are almost coming. Yes. Anyway, yes. sir, please your yes, final sir, yeah, comments. Yeah, yes, final comments. Nay, nay, I have no final comments. I, I, <laughs> I, think, I think we should, uh, you've, you've done a thoroughly good job. Um, thank you. Thank you for inviting me. I appreciate your uh, inviting me and I thank uh, all the discussants for their very valuable uh, insights. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So let me please wind up. Yeah. Yes. No. Just we'll just uh, stop. Just give a vote of thanks. Yeah. Yes, and uh, I really thank all the uh, discussants today and all the panelists and viewers, uh, those who participated in this very special lecture, uh, labor employment and pandemic policy suggestions and the way forward for budget 2021. And we are so grat grateful uh, to uh, uh, speaker for this uh, special lecture, Professor Shantosh Maharatra, for highlighting uh, these issues. I'm sure. Uh, a lot of media will cover tomorrow a lot of stories uh, uh, based out of it and and forward also and we we will uh, look into how the budget uh, uh, goes on and what can be really done during this tough time of pandemic so uh, thank you everyone thank you chair professor devanathan and our other panelists professor sarthi acharya uh, dr amrita pillai uh, professor utpal day and uh, yeah, professor indra hirve also and uh, professor vadud uh, uh, and professor ilyas from bangladesh uh, thank you. Have a good night. Thanks a lot. Thank Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. Mm -hmm. Okay.